Hey guys, thanks so much for watching and listening to part two of our series called Responding to Christianity. Uh, this one's really out of the ordinary for us. We've never done this before because uh, we started this series last week in August of 2022. And then for part two of this series, uh, we were just getting ready to deliver this message on Wednesday night and the power went out. And uh, that was, you know, something that wasn't planned and we made it work. We uh, went ahead and had a, a good time uh, going through this conversation together as a youth group, but we already knew that there were a lot of people who weren't able to be there that night. Some people asked us right after the message, hey, is there any way that we've got a recording of this? Is there any way that I could share this with a friend? Uh, and so we put some of those notes out there real quick, but we wanted to go ahead and uh, record this. So uh, I, I do wanna clarify as I'm delivering this content that I prepared this for my students at Westside Baptist Church with Movement Youth. Uh, so maybe you're watching this and, and you don't know me this well, uh, or you don't know me as well as I know our kids at Westside, and you might think, wow, I can't believe he just said that. Uh, well, keep in mind that, like I said, I've prepared this for our youth. I've prepared this for kids, some kids that I know and love, and, and I think I have some liberty to say things that I might not say to a complete and total stranger. Uh, but like I said, we're in part two, and in the first part of this message, Kendall delivered that just a little bit ago, uh, she dealt with this question, uh, how can God send innocent people to hell? How can God send innocent people to hell? And I think that's a really important question to ask. Uh, she answered that question very, very well. If you uh, find any value in this, maybe you go back and watch that one. Uh, we'll make sure that it's linked right here. It's easy to find. Uh, but in this message, which I just delivered last night to our students in person with the lights out, uh, with just the emergency lights on, we lost power. Uh, the question that we're answering now is, isn't Christianity homophobic? Isn't it? I mean, I've heard that. Maybe you've heard that before as well. Maybe uh, people have told you that. Uh, maybe people have said that in kind of an accusatory tone. Hey, I can't believe that you're a part of, of a church, organized religion. I mean, they're the absolute worst. They're bigoted, they're homophobic, and, and we want to deal with that. Um, we want to deal with it as sensitively, as graciously, but also as biblically as we possibly can. Um, I think that out of all of the the questions or the topics that we're addressing in this series, uh, this is the most sensitive and the most personal of all the questions that we're dealing with. You know, like I said, this is recorded in 2022. I think this is probably gonna be the most sensitive message that we record all year long. And it's sensitive because everyone deals with this. This is something that all of us deal with, whether uh, it's something we deal with ourselves, we're attracted to people of the same sex, or someone that you love is dealing with this. Someone that you know, someone that you're friends with, uh, or that maybe they're in your family. And if by chance you don't know someone who's dealing with this personally, just please understand uh, that there are a lot of people dealing with this. Nobody chooses their attractions. They don't get to, you don't get to choose who you are attracted to. And all of us deal with issues, whether it's uh, same-sex attraction uh, or, or you know something along those lines. All of us deal with issues that we can't seem to get over. We try as best we can, but we can't get over these issues. That doesn't mean that God's not still restoring us. That doesn't mean uh, that he's not still working in our lives. It certainly doesn't mean that he doesn't love us. Uh, so, you know, this is a very topical message. Um, it is. We, we said, hey, this is a, an urgent issue in the same way that like a surgeon or a doctor might say, hey, we're bleeding out over here. We've got we've to gotta patch this up. We've got to stop the bleeding right here. We feel some urgency to address this. And so we're not going like chapter by chapter, book by book, and then we just stumbled upon this. To be fair, we did seek out uh, passages of scripture that deal with this. Um, and, you know, I just want to be aware of that. I, I'm not trying to cherry pick scripture. I'm not trying to say, oh, look, see, I got this one Bible verse. Aha, see, I told you. I didn't just sit here and Google homosexuality in the Bible and go, aha, see, this verse right here says that homosexuality is a sin. That's not what I'm trying to do. Um, I, I really hope that this can be encouraging to a lot of us. I hope that this can give us some answers. This can help us to uh, explain what we believe, especially if you're a Christian. And so uh, I wanted to be clear about my intent. I also want to ask that you would be patient with me. Please be patient with me as I deal with this question. You know, um, when I delivered this in person, I hated it. I hated it because the, the power went out. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think the message is fine. But um, the power went out, which means I had no microphone. I was speaking to about 200 people in a gym while it was raining. So I had to raise my voice and project so that people could hear me. And even some people in the back of the room couldn't hear me very well. So I hated that because I don't want a raised voice or body language to communicate that I'm angry, because I'm not angry, I promise. Uh, I'm not angry with any uh, people or people groups or people who identify this way or that way. Um, I, please be patient and trust my heart. Uh, also, please be patient with me, because I'm probably gonna use some terms that you might not prefer. Some terms that you would not prefer, and, and please trust my heart, I don't intend 
to offend anyone necessarily. Uh, so much of the words that we use when it comes to this topic in particular have changed. Uh, it, it used to be that, hey, we, we, we refer to people who um, are attracted to, to, to members of the opposite sex in this way. And you might even be angry saying, hey, hey, stop saying sex. It's gender. It's different. And, and you know, I might, I might push back a little bit there. Um, but these words continue to change. And I think that they're, gonna, they're going to keep changing. And so I want to try to be, you know, accurate. And I want to try to use biblical terms as much as possible. But please trust my heart. I'm not trying to uh, trigger anyone or offend anyone unnecessarily. And tonight, uh, <laughs> I'm reading my notes from last night. Maybe it is nighttime as you're watching this or listening to this. I don't know if it's daytime, morning, uh, if you're listening to it on your way to school. Tonight, this morning, wherever you are, uh, you're, you're probably watching this or listening to this because you're curious about this question. Are Christians homophobic? Uh, some of you are here because you, you, you know that, or you believe that Christianity is not homophobic, but you don't know how to articulate that. And you're thinking, okay, this is how, this is going to help me explain my church to my friends who have some questions about what we believe. And maybe they have asked me that, hey, are you guys bigots? I heard Christians are bigots and homophobic. Um, but maybe, possibly, you're watching this, you're listening to this right now because you're angry and, and maybe you're even ready to fight. You're ready to argue. And so I just want to ask you as best you're, as you possibly can um, to, to, to have an open mind as we look at God's word. I, I never want to just tell you this is what Zach Jernigan believes. I want to submit my ideas to God's word and say, hey, this is what he said um, and, and kind of go from there. So um, please, please do your best. And I'm going to try to do my best to be as, as conscientious and as gentle while not apologizing for God's word. So um, I think this is something that we take so personally, uh, and that's why I want to be careful, but I do believe that that's kind of the problem. I think that in, in, in many ways, we have made this more of a personal issue than it should be. You're like, Zach, how could you say that? This is incredibly personal. I understand that it is, but I don't know that it's supposed to be. Here's what I mean. There are a lot of things that I would use to um, def define myself or, or describe myself is a better way to say that. But there are very few things that I would use to identify myself or define myself. I might say, hey, I like basketball, but that's, that's not who I am. I might say, hey, I'm actually attracted to people of the opposite sex. I'm married uh, to a lovely woman named Janae. We have a son named Maverick. And, 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 you know, that's a big part of who I am. But I don't think that that's the most important thing about who I am. And in many ways, culture and the world around us, media, uh, maybe even uh, your educators have told you that your sexual identity is who you are. That is the most important thing about you. It's the most intrinsic, uh, you know, necessary detail of, of, of who you are. And I just want to push back against that. That's not what God's word says. Uh, God's word says that that is a part of who we are, but it's so much more than that. So uh, in order for us to have a constructive conversation about homosexuality, which we're going to try to do here, we've got to address a few popular objections. This is not meant to be personal. I'm not trying to win an argument. I hope that I, that I win a friend. I hope that uh, you watch this video or listen to this podcast and say, hey, like, I even I might even still disagree with that guy, but I kind of like him. I, I don't want you to like me, but I want you to say, hey, maybe the church isn't the boogeyman after all. Maybe they're not so bad. Maybe they're not absolute bigots. So we're going to deal with some obje objections. we got three of them, and then we're going to break down one passage of scripture. I'm going to tell you that God loves you. I'm gonna, that's what I'm going to do. So objection number one, objection number one is this. Maybe you've heard this on TikTok uh, from our, our wonderful TikTok theologians. Uh, this objection says, the Bible doesn't even address homosexuality. So what are we doing here? The this objection says, the Bible doesn't even address homosexuality. It says that that word was added to the Bible later. Well, that's kind of right, kind of wrong, and, and it's really, really misleading. I'll explain why. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Uh, this is one passage that we look at a lot when it comes to this issue. Again, not trying to cherry pick, but I want to deal with this objection. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, I'm reading out of the ESV, says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor uh, adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality will inherit, will inherit the kingdom of God. The, the verse continues, and we're going to come back to that verse in detail later. Uh, but right here, we see two of these words that uh, are, are debated right now. One's debated more than the other. Let's deal with the, the softer one first, literally softer. Uh, the first one is malakoi. In my translation, that's the word that is uh, translated as adulterers here uh, in the English Standard Version. This word malakoi literally means soft or effeminate. Uh, Philo, who is a Greek writer, said that these were man-women or men-women who desire to wholly change their condition to that of men. Uh, Lucan and Phaedrus, who were Roman writers, use the same term to describe castration. 
uh, men who wanted to look like women. Not trying to get too graphic, but you understand. Uh, this was an, basically like an, an ancient uh, gender reassignment surgery. Okay, and then uh, this is this is the word that's not really that heavily disputed. So I won't spend quite as much time here, but that's just a little bit of what that word means. And then let's deal with the the hot topic, the one that is a little bit more uh, heavily disputed, fiercely disputed, and that is uh, arsenicoitai. Uh, arsenicoitai. That's a word that you know in in the ESV is translated as homosexuality. If you're reading out of the NIV, it just says men who have sex with men. It's a little bit more descriptive and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, this is a compound word, which is part of the reason it's confusing. It comes from arson, which means man, and then koitai, which means uh, either bed or sleeps with. And in this context, I think it makes a whole lot more sense. They're not saying, hey, you man bed. Like this is somebody who is a man sleeping with a man. Uh, it can be either a verb or a noun, but it, it's a compound word that seems like Paul digs up out of Leviticus chapter 18 and 19. And he would have taken that from the Greek Septuagint, which was translated from Hebrew into Greek a few hundred years before Paul's time. Um, and, and it's confusing because we don't see this exact compound word anywhere else in scripture. Not only that, we don't see it anywhere else in uh, other Roman or Greek writing around that time. And so we're like, Paul, what are you doing here? Well, it seems like, uh, like I said, he's, he's kind of mashing two words together and saying, hey, we're going to make sense of this and we're going to describe it in the most um, clear way that we possibly can. So uh, to be fair, some people are like, hey, the word homosexuality was added to our Bible, you know, after the fact, way later. And I'm going to be honest, that's technically true. And here's why. Because the word homosexuality in the English language wasn't even invented, wasn't added to the English language until the 1800s. And so, yeah, it was added later. Like there was, there was all kinds of other words that they used before them, but they all meant the same thing. In fact, I think homosexuality is a little bit more open to interpretation which is why it's a good thing that Paul says, hey, I'm going to just be as clear as I possibly can. I'm not talking about this or that. I'm saying men who have sex with men. That's what he's talking about here. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to win an argument. I'm trying to say, hey, I got you. See, you know, take that uh, checkmate atheist. That, that's not what I'm trying to do. Um, I, I just want to deal with this objection so that when we have a con, hopefully a constructive conversation, we're on the same page and we're able to be productive. So um, I'm gonna share a lot of these resources with you at the end, uh, just just hang on. Don't start throwing stuff at the, the TV or the, 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 the computer, however you're watching this or listening to this right now. I'm gonna share a lot of these resources with you. Um, so yeah, the word homosexuality was technically added, uh, but I think it would actually even be better if, if you wanna make that argument. Not you, if, if someone out there wants to make that argument, I think we could go back to a more traditional, a more conventional translation. Just say, men who have sex with men. And it's not as open to interpretation. Um, and so, you know, just to answer this objection, uh, hey, wasn't that word added later? Uh, you know, isn't it, isn't it true that the Bible doesn't even address this issue? No, no, no. The Bible does address it. And the Bible addresses homosexuality with intentionally measurable descriptive terms. With intentionally measurable descriptive terms. Uh, Paul's like, read my lips. I'm talking about Men who have sex with men. That's just how he's saying it. Uh, the debate for or against homosexuality, though, is not won or lost based on these one or two words. It's not like, aha, I have made a pretty convincing argument that Zach's wrong and he doesn't know what he's talking about. Sometimes I am wrong. Um, but it's not won or lost over these two words. And, and a lot of times people will say, Psh, this is this is Paul. What does Paul know anyways? I mean, who? I, I, I don't even like the guy. What about Jesus? What does Jesus say? And it's funny because people are people who don't even necessarily believe in Jesus are now pointing to Jesus as an authoritative figure on this subject. Maybe just, I don't know. Um, so this guy, Jesus never addressed homosexuality. He never explicitly said homosexuality is a sin, et cetera, et cetera. It says it in Leviticus, Paul says it, but Jesus never said it. Well, there's three problems with that. Three problems with that. Number one, Jesus does address it in Mark chapter 10. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus does address it. Uh, when asked about marriage, Jesus quotes Genesis 1, 27. And I'll read that. He says, um, people are like, Jesus, what's the deal with marriage? What do you think about marriage? What's your take on marriage? Rabbi, Rabbi, what, what do you think? What do we need to know about marriage? He says, well, for starters, God created man in his own image. And in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So they're like, Jesus, tell us about marriage. And he's like, well, for starters, it's between a man and a woman. You know, that's, that's like the baseline. That's where we start uh, when we talk about uh, marriage. And so the second problem with that is that Jesus spent most of his time talking to Jews. There were some, there were some um, Gentiles there as well, but he's primarily talking to Jews. And the Roman Empire, you're talking about Gentiles, 
The Roman Empire was incredibly accepting, was very progressive when it came to non-traditional sexuality, but the Jews weren't. Like, it was in their, their Bible for a couple thousand years at this point that that's off limits. We don't do that. It's bad. No, no. And so uh, it didn't need to be addressed as explicitly while Jesus was preaching itinerantly in uh, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. So uh, that's the second thing. Uh, you know, already we said Jesus does address it in Mark chapter 10. Uh, then Jesus spent most of his time talking to Jews. It wasn't as urgent. And then three, you really can't detach Jesus's teachings from the teachings of his disciples, uh, of his closest, most heavily endorsed disciples. So you can't say, I mean, psh, that's just, that's just Paul. What does Paul know? Well, Peter endorsed Paul's teachings as authoritative. He does that in second Peter chapter three, verse 16. Um, this is a little bit of like a bibliology conversation, but you, you can't say, well, Jesus said this, but Paul said this. And so I am referring, like they don't contradict one another. They're playing for the same team. Um, and, and Jesus rep, Paul represents Jesus, uh, just as Jesus represents God and so on and so forth. So, uh, that's a co conversation for another time. But again, you can't say, well, well, Jesus said it, Paul didn't, because that's an argument from silence. That's an argument from silence, which is the weakest kind of argument that you can make. You know what else Jesus never explicitly addressed? Pedophilia. He never specifically, word for word, explicitly said, pedophilia is a sin. Don't do it. There's some things that hopefully Jesus shouldn't have to say. I mean, I understand. I understand if you want to push back against that. Uh, but I think if you're saying, well, Jesus never specifically said it. Well, he didn't address pedophilia either. So if you're going to make that argument, you're eventually going to have to be okay with pedophilia, with grown adult men taking advantage of children. And, and that's not some place that I think most of us are willing to go. Um, so that's the first objection. Does the Bible actually address this? Yes. Second objection is this. Uh, hey, the practices being condemned in the Bible, those were exploitative and abusive. But loving, monogamous, consensual, homosexual relationships can be God-honoring. I'm going to say that again because it was a mouthful. The second objection that we're dealing with is this. That, hey, the practices being condemned in the Bible were exploitative and abusive. But loving, monogamous, consensual, homosexual relationships can be God-honoring. Okay? And, you know, to be fair, exploitative kind of... Uh, abusive homosexual relationships that this argument makes, those were prevalent in the Roman Empire. They were very prevalent in the Roman Empire. They were a part of the Greek um, uh, apprenticeship program that was very, very common. So it's something to consider and something for us to answer. The problem with this objection, though, is that Scripture doesn't use exploitative language. Scripture doesn't use exploitative language. It doesn't say, hey, uh, rape is bad. I mean, it, it does elsewhere, but here it doesn't say, Hey, by the way, to clarify, I'm only talking about rape here. To put it bluntly, it doesn't say rape is a sin. It uses all-encompassing language. So scripture doesn't use exploitative language. It uses all-encompassing language. This would be like if, if I came to you and said, you know, on a Wednesday night at, at our church and youth group, uh, we got to stack up the chairs when we're done and put them away. It's like 250 chairs. It's a lot. It's a, it's a lot of work. Um, this would be like I came to you and said, hey, I need you to put away all 250 chairs that are in the gym tonight. And you looked at me and you're like, okay, I hear you loud and clear. I am going to put away some of the chairs on the left side of the room. Got it. No, 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 no. You're missing the, you're, you just said, you just limited what I said. I said something with really broad, all encompassing terminology and you're limiting it. That's what this argument does. And so this is, this is why we, we don't start this in Genesis chapter 19 when we talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, maybe you're familiar with that argument. Um, we, we start in Genesis chapter 1, where God says, hey, marriage is between one man and one woman. We don't go to Genesis 19, where uh, Lot is with his family in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, and uh, these angels come, and um, uh, these, these angels come to really bring them out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then, um, you know, th these angels come in, and it says right here in verse four, it says that all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and they said, where are the men that, you, you came to, that came to you tonight? Bring them outside. Bring them to us so that we can have sex with them. Like this was, this is some really messed up, nasty stuff. This is not something that we would endorse. This is, this is awful. Most cultures, uh, whether you're progressive or really, really conservative, would say, hey, rape is bad. Uh, mob rape, especially bad. Uh, we're not condoning that. But to be, to be fair, this is not a passage of scripture that explicitly condones consensual relationships, Right? 
right? I, I wouldn't use this passage of scripture as an argument to do that. Um, but people who are making this argument are making a ton of assumptions, are making a ton of assumptions. They are assuming that all homosexual relationships in the Bible were coercive, were abusive, were um, about power and domineering that power, uh, expressing that power over someone who was in a lower class than someone. And, and that's just not true. Uh, I, I got this. I'll, I'll share all of these resources with you again at the end. But Bernadette Bruton uh, addresses this head on in her book, Love Between Women. She says, contrary to the view that the idea of sexual orientation did not develop until the 19th century, the astrological sources demonstrate the existence in the Roman world of the concept of a lifelong, of lifelong erotic orientation. Lifelong erotic orientation, like people who were, were married, people who had relationships. I'll just give you a few examples. Agathon was a Greek poet, and he had a lifelong consensual partner. Uh, uh, I'm not going to say this guy's name right. I always say it per, uh, Parmenides. I don't think that's it. Eh, yeah, it's Parmenides. Parmenides had a lifelong consensual uh, partner as well. Clement of Alexandria, granted he's uh, second century, third century. Uh, he's an early church father. Uh, addresses lesbian relationships, re lesbian marriages specifically, that were going on in his community, and so uh, this is this is a really big point. This is this is very important for us to understand because that would mean that Paul would have understood that there was such a thing as loving, monogamous, consensual relationships when he said that homosexuality was a sin. You're, it's not like oh silly Paul he. <laughs> He's just ignorant. He's limited by you know his his place and time in culture. He he doesn't understand things as as nuanced as we understand them now. Um, he knew exactly what he was saying. He was like, read my lips. All homosexual activity is a sin, and so uh, he says that. Um, and then uh, even if Paul uh, didn't understand what he's saying, I'm not saying he didn't, but even if he didn't, he's being inspired and led by the Holy Spirit when he writes these things. Do you think God didn't know that some people could be uh, have, have a consensual, loving, monogamous relationship? No, of course God knew that. He invented sexuality. He in invented the human body. Um, and so even if uh, Paul didn't understand that, God certainly did. Um, he invented sexuality for crying out loud. Okay, objection number three. Uh, the ancient world didn't understand homosexual identity the way that we do today. Hey, those, those guys are so old. What could they possibly know? I mean... They did build pyramids, but what, what could they possibly know? Uh, this isn't just something that non-Christians believe. This is something that many self-professing Christians argue as well. Some of them are pastors. Some of them are uh, seminary professors. Uh, there's one example right here. This was a New Testament professor. Uh, Victor Paul Furnish argued that since Paul was unaware of the modern concept of homosexual orientation, his rejection of homosexuality must itself be rejected. Like that's pretty radical. You're saying, hey, we've got to, we've just got to like tear that page out, throw it in the trash. It's it, you know, he didn't know what he was talking about, silly Paul. That's a horrible argument to be making. And I think the whole thing really crumbles around you if you do that. But this is what he said. He said, not only the terms, but the concepts of homosexual and homosexuality were unknown in Paul's day. These terms like heterosexual and heterosexuality, bisexual, bisexuality, presuppose an understanding of human sexuality that was possible only with the advent of modern psychology and sociological analysis. The, the ancient writers were operating without the vaguest idea of what we dare uh, learned to call sexual orientation. I'm going to be honest, th that would be nice. That would be way more convenient. It would make this argument, or rather, hopefully it's not an argument, it would make this conversation uh, and, and the message that I delivered last night in the dark, for crying out loud, it'd make it a lot less awkward. It really would. Uh, conversations like this would be way less uncomfortable, but it's just not true. The fact is that ancient writers did have a very, very similar understanding of sexual orientation. This is what Aristotle said in the fourth century BC uh, in Ethics. He said, some homoerotic desire springs from habit, but some springs from nature. Did you hear what he just said? Some springs from nature, as in naturally, that's the way that this person is. He's saying, hey, this is how they're wired. Uh, he goes on to call it a birth defect. We wouldn't use that term. Uh, but he says, some people are gay out of experience, out of something that happened to them, and they, they enjoyed that, and they, they wanted to pursue that more. But others, that's just the way that they are, dude. That's just, that's just who they are. And, and he's saying that 400 years, 300 years before Paul, give or take. And so uh, I'm pushing back about this whole idea that they don't have the vaguest sense, 
It's getting pretty warm here. Uh, again, this name, I cannot say the dude's name. Uh, Parmenides, Parmesan. Parmesan says in the fifth century BC uh, that men that desire, I'm just gonna say homosexual activity because it's a pretty graphic term, trust me there. You can Google it later if you want. Uh, men that desire homosexual activity are generated in the act of conception. He's saying, hey, they're born that way. That's the way that they were born. In fact, before they were born, when they were conceived, they were gay. Uh, that, that's who they are. And so that's actually not just vague, like vaguely close to a modern idea of sexual orientation. Actually, we're getting pretty darn warm here. We're getting very, very similar. I would argue, and, and this is a response to that uh, objection, that ancient writers confirm that both Paul and his audience would have had a surprisingly modern view of sexual identity. That, that's just something that you need to consider. Okay, these, these are the three, I think, biggest objections that uh, people make when we're, when we're examining scripture or we're arguing about culture and history and context and things like that. I'm just sharing all those things because I think if, if, you, if you've already heard that, you might, already, you might dismiss what I'm going to say later. And I, I, I didn't say that to win an argument. I, I hope it didn't come across as argumentative in, in, a, in, a, in a, a mean tone. I'm not trying to be mean. Uh, but I want us to be able to, to have a, an even playing field as we look at uh, Scripture more closely. Uh, so I'm going from teaching to a little bit more preaching. I'm not trying to change your mind quite as much here. Hopefully I've done that a little bit, and now I want, I want to change your heart. I hope that God changes your heart. I can't do that. I hope that He does. Uh, so we, we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 a little bit already, but I want to look at it one more time. We referenced this uh, just briefly, and now we're, we're really digging deeper. Paul is talking to some super snobby Christians right here. He's talking to some super snobby religious people who'd honestly, they'd gotten really proud. They'd gotten really big headed and he's, he's kind of putting them in their place here. So maybe you know some super snobby Christians. Maybe you think I'm a super snobby Christian. I don't know. Um, but, but I think all of us would probably have really enjoyed this moment if we were there because he kind of like puts them in their place. So this is what he says in verse 9. We read this again, but we're going to read it with a new perspective. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, in the NIV, uh, men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Wow. Okay, that is, uh, that, those are some pretty harsh words. Uh, that's not very loving. That's, that's so bigoted. That's not very inclusive. Well, I didn't write it. God did. So uh, the first thing that I want to point out here is yes. I'm going to say it. Some of you are going to get mad, but I love you. God does condemn homosexual activity as a sin. He does. It's very, very clear in scripture. We can't uh, work around it. It's unavoidable. Uh, and I'm not saying that like I'm apologizing for God's word. I, I don't want to do that. Um, but hear me out. Nine times out of 10, when we pull this verse up, when we pull this verse up, hey, I'm going straight to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You might have even rolled your eyes when I said that. Oh gosh, here he goes. Most of the time when we come to this passage, we're doing that to say, see, look right here. I told you, I got you. I told you, I knew it. I, I just proved my point. It says right here, it's a sin. Can't do that. It's a no-no in your face. And, and if I've ever done that to somebody who's watching or listening, I, I'm very sorry. If someone uh, in, in a teaching or pastoral position has ever done that, I, I, I apologize. That, that's not really the focus of this passage. Have you ever noticed that it's really easy to see someone else's mistakes. I know when I was playing basketball and football in high school, like it was so easy for me to see that someone else ran that route wrong. And in my mind, like I do it so much better. I never make that mistake. And you know, when I'm playing basketball, I'm like, they're shot. Their, their form is just, it's horrible. Oh, it's disgusting. Meanwhile, I had like a, a yucky looking shot. When I saw pictures of myself shooting, I was like, ugh, gross. Um, you know, Larry Bird would just roll over in his grave if he saw, saw my shooting form. Um, it's so much easier to see mistakes in other people than it is to see those mistakes in ourselves. And when we see this verse, so often we pounce because we open it up and we see, hey, people who practice homosexuality, men who have sex with men. See, I told you, plain as day, it's a sin. And for many of us, that's someone else's sin. For many of us, that's not something that you deal with personally. And, and maybe you know someone else who uh, struggles with that sin, and you say, see, that person, they're sinning. But you know who else's sin is listed right next to theirs? Do you know who else's sin is listed right next to theirs? Yours and mine. See, what we do is we pick someone else's sin out of the verse while we ignore our own. 
we some, see someone else's sin and we get tunnel vision and we're like, aha, I told you so. Meanwhile, God's trying to say, hey, you're greedy. Hey, you're a reviler. You're a swindler. You are an idolater. You're sexually immoral, just maybe in a different way. And, and God is trying to say, hey, this verse is for you, not just someone who struggles with same-sex attraction. Paul's writing this passage here because they had forgotten where they came from. He lists all of these sins side by side, which prompts the question that some of you came here for. You, you want to know, hey, is Christianity homophobic? Is, is, is homosexuality more sinful or is it a worse sin than some of the other sins? No. And no. no God's word does not say that. That is the actual definition of homophobia. Uh, to use that definition, you know, does Christianity have disdain for or a fear of, of homosexuality? Is, is Christianity averse to homosexuality? No. Christianity, the church, is averse to sin. God's word is averse to sin. And this isn't condemning. This isn't hateful. He's actually gearing us up for some really good news. Look at verse 11. He's, he said, listen, all these people, people I just listed, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God, not unless God changes them, not unless he changes their heart. In verse 11, and such were some of you. Mic drop moment right here. This is where everybody goes, ooh, like burnt. Like you, you just got all these snobby Christians. You just got all these snobby religious people. He says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Like this is such amazing news. This is such fantastic news. And this is to humble this group of people, but it's to remind them, hey, don't forget where you came from. Don't remember you were sinning too. Don't remember that you, you were identified, you were marked by these sins that maybe you weren't even aware that you were doing it, but that used to be you. And so he's saying, hey, do you realize that some of those people, they're going to be in your church one day. Some of those people you think you're so much better than them, they're going to be worshiping God right beside you because hopefully you're going to share the gospel. You realize that you're going to be spending eternity in heaven with some of these people. You need to remember, you need to remember who you were. This passage is not homophobic because this passing, passage isn't really about homosexuality. It's mentioned, but this passage is about humility. This passage is way more about humility than it is about homosexuality. I'm not homophobic because I'll tell you what, I can relate to what it's like to be greedy. I can relate to what it's like to lust. I can relate uh, to, to say, hey, that's, that's sinful. God says I'm not supposed to do it, but I really like it. Like I struggle in that way. And some of you do as well. This passage is saying, hey, listen, these people, they rejected God's definition. They broke his laws. They struggle with sin. Sometimes they lose a battle to sin. And I do as well. I'm telling I'm, I'm, I'm being honest. I'm confessing that right now. And so I, I struggle with a different brand of sin, but I struggle every single day. And I don't say that to trivialize what you're going through if you struggle with same-sex attraction. I'm not just trying to say like, hey, it's no big deal. We all struggle. You might be like, Zach, you don't understand. And that, that's probably fair. I don't understand exactly what it's like to walk a mile in your shoes. I don't understand what it's like to struggle in the exact same way that you struggle. And, and again, I'm not trying to be trivial. Um, but I want to offer some encouragement here. The first encouragement I just want to list is this. No one goes to hell for sinful tendencies. No one goes to hell. No one is condemned for sinful tendencies. And here's what I mean by that. Um, again, we, I've tried to make this argument. Hey, we, we really don't need to identify ourselves uh, or, or place our, 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 our identity and our sexuality. Um, but as I said just a second ago, I said, God's word is very clear. God's word clearly condemns homosexual activity. And I tried to enunciate that word as clearly as I could. So hopefully you caught it. But if you didn't, here's what I mean. Um, look at James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. In James 1, 14 and 15, it's, he says, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. The devil didn't make you do it. No, you, that's, that's your desire. Own it. That's in you. And then desire, when it has conceived, gives, for, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And so desire or that tendency that maybe you feel like, Zach, I can't, I can't turn this off. I, I would have done it by now if I could. That desire is not sin. It can lead to sin in the same way that there are some people who really, really struggle with pornography. They desire to look at that. And I know some people who would say, I've been healed from that. I don't struggle with that anymore. It's not a, really a temptation for me anymore. Uh, but I know some people who have been married, who have kids, some people who are in their 50s and 60s who struggle every single day to not open their phone and look at pornography. And so what I'm, what I'm saying is like that Tendency, it's not a sin that they desire. It's a sin when they actually go look at it and act on that desire, when they act on that, that, that tendency, tendency. And so you may be carrying some immense guilt 
or shame because you feel a certain way or you have this tendency that you're aware of. Uh, but I just want to point out that condemnation is of the devil and conviction is of the Holy Spirit. Condemnation, that, that shameful, like, you suck, you're dirty, God's never going to love you, he will never forgive you, your family won't accept you, your church doesn't want you there, that is condemnation. It's from Satan, he's a liar, and you gotta, you got to rebuke that. Conviction, sometimes we confuse the two, but conviction is from the Holy Spirit. Rather than saying, you're dirty and you're gross and I don't want you, conviction from God says, I love you, but that's not for you. Sometimes, I, I love my son Maverick so much, um, he, he's not even one year old just yet, um, and, and sometimes I'll see he wants to play with something that is going to electrocute him or stab him or, or cut him or something along those lines. And I, I run up there and I say, I love you so much. I'm not here to ruin your day, but that is not for you. You can't put your finger in the electrical socket. You can't run with a knife. You can't grab daddy's razor out of the drawer because you're going to cut yourself. I love you, but I am limiting you because that's not for you. That's not for you. And so uh, condemnation is of the devil, but conviction is from the Holy Spirit. Um, and so I've already said, I'm trying to say, guys, I'm in the same boat as you. Uh, if not the exact same boat, I'm in a boat that looks just like it. I struggle with sin. I struggle with my own temptation. Uh, I, I'm familiar with that struggle, even if it's a little bit different or nuanced for me. But I, I want to point out um, that, that some people, uh, some, some people who are Christian men and women, they, they've struggled with same-sex attraction. And I'm, I'm, just, I'm taking their words, not mine. But some of them have told me in their own words, not mine, that they've been healed from that and that they don't struggle with that, um, at least not in the way that they used to. So I think that there are varying degrees or varying levels of healing. Uh, there are some people, yeah, I think I should clarify, there are varying levels of healing on this side of heaven. When we get to heaven, when God uh, brings us home, if you're a follower of Jesus, that's where you're going. He glorifies us. He perfectly restores us like there is no sin. There is no uh, temptation. We don't struggle with that anymore. That sin nature is is finally put to rest. But there are varying levels of healing on this side of heaven. Because I know some people that, that still struggle, but not as much as they used to. Not in the same way, not with the same intensity. And then I know some people who aren't attracted to the same sex at all anymore. And some people have said, I, I barely remember that. I don't even remember what that feels like. And I don't mean to say like, hey, just, just be patient. It's going to go away. Because it might not. I don't, I don't want to promise you something that God's word doesn't promise. He never says that we're not going to struggle with temptation. Um, in the same way, I know people who used to struggle with pornography and, and you know, they've, some of them have completely put that to death and they don't struggle with it. And some people, they have to fight hell every single day or else that creeps back into their lives. And some of you are thinking right now, I'm getting close to the end. You can see that little bar on the bottom of the screen. I didn't need to tell you that. I'm not good at YouTube. But some of you guys are thinking, Zach, I'm struggling with same-sex attraction right now. What do you recommend that I do? Zach, I, I, this is real for me. This isn't hypothetical. This isn't somebody else. You're saying, Zach, this is real for me. What do I do? What do you recommend? I would recommend that you fight sin and follow Jesus. I'd recommend that you fight sin and follow Jesus. I, I would beg you not to give in to that, um, that, that tendency, that sinful tendency. I would beg you not to act on that. I would beg you to, to find your identity in Christ. And every time that the enemy tries to tell you, no, you need to give in. Every time culture needs, tries to tell you, no, this is who you are. You just need to accept it and, and even, um, uh, you know, engage that fully. I want to tell you, no, fight sin and follow Jesus. Some of you guys are asking, hey, will I ever get married? What does this mean for me? Like I said before, I know some people who struggle with same-sex attraction. Some still do. And yet I know people in both of those categories who are happily married with children. You might, I, I don't think I could ever do that. Maybe you couldn't. I do know some people who say that, hey, that's not healthy for me right now. That would not be a good idea right now. Um, and so I, I don't think that there's a one size fits all solution to this. Um, sometimes people are healed completely. Sometimes people are healed um, in uh, varying degrees. And sometimes people just say, hey, I think God has called me to be single. And, and this is why, where I kind of want to land. I want to talk about singleness for a second because whether you're attracted to somebody of the same sex or you're attracted to uh, people of the opposite sex, we have to stop treating singleness like a death sentence. We have to stop treating singleness for like, like it's a death sentence. Um, I think it was Rebecca McLaughlin said this. She said, deep, genuine friendships are not a consolation prize for people who can't have romantic relationships. Deep, genuine friendships are not a consolation prize for people who can't have romantic relationships. Um, I guess I could say it this way. Marriage is a kind of love, 
Marriage is a great kind of love. It's romantic and it's a different kind of relationship, but it's not even the best kind of love, according to scripture. It's not. I'm not making this up. This isn't God's word. John 15, 13, Jesus says, greater love hath no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. He says, there is no greater love than to lay down your life for your friends. You're like, well, Jesus didn't really mean that. He's, I mean, obviously marriage, right? No, no, no. Jesus said what he said. Jesus wasn't married. Jesus, I'm pretty sure, has a pretty good understanding of what marriage is like. He's fully God. He is omnipotent. He's all-knowing. He's omniscient. He's everywhere. I think he knows what he's saying here. And so Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7 that singleness is a good thing. It's not a death sentence. It's not, you know, this, this disease that's like icky. Oh, gross. Ah, oh, I caught the singleness. Ah, like how do I get it off? Like if this is a gift, how do I return that gift, you know? Um, that's not what Paul is saying. He's saying, listen, I say this as a concession, not as a command, but I wish that all of you were as, some, as I am. I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. He's saying, listen, I wish more people were single. He's like, I'm not tr trying to tell you how to do your life. This is a concession, not, as a, not a command. Um, but this is... This is so much more, this is about so much more than just homosexuality. This is about heterosexuality as well, but it's even more than that. This goes back to the core of our relationships because some of you are attracted to the opposite sex and you think, oh no, what if I'm called to be single? I'll never be complete. Some of you guys are like, I'm attracted to the same sex and, and the Bible says I can't do that, so I guess I'm never going to be complete. Hold on. Romantic relationships can complement you, but they will never complete you. I'm going to say that again. Romantic relationships can complement you, but they will never complete you. They, they just can't do that. Only Jesus can, can make you whole. And Jesus takes our broken desires. He takes our, our defectiveness. Like, I'm defective. You're defective. You're like, you're not operating and I'm not operating the way that God designed us because sin has corrupted this world. He takes our defective, sinful desires and he perfectly restores us. He washes our sins as white as snow. And so I hope... I hope that as we've talked about this, uh, I talked about it to my students, and, and maybe you're watching this, you, you are one of my students, I love you, um, and, and maybe someone shared this with you, and, and you're just visiting this conversation right now, I invite you to be a part of anything that we're doing. You, we're not keeping people out, but whoever you are, I hope that as we've looked at Scripture, we can see that God's Word does speak to homosexuality. It does. It condemns homosexual activity as a sin, but it also speaks to a whole range of other issues as well. And none of us are better than anyone else. The Bible does not teach that homosexuality is the worst sin. Some of you are, are listening to this or you're watching this and, and you're saying to yourself, like, I don't get this. But some of you guys, you're, like, you, you're ready to admit. You're saying, I, I, I'm gay or maybe I'm straight. You're saying, I, I, I'm hateful. I'm greedy. Maybe you're a, a pervert. Like that's that's honestly what like watching other people have sex on TV or on a phone. It, like if that was a window that you were looking, you're a pervert. That's what it is. Maybe you, you'd say you're a liar. Uh, maybe you say I, I steal stuff. I'm a thief. Maybe you're a gossip. And I just want to say this to you: God loves you. God is chasing after you. He died for you. He rose from the dead for you. He defeated your sin, and He is inviting you. He's inviting all of humanity to accept the gift of forgiveness and the gift of salvation and to submit our lives to his plan. And I know that that sounds, maybe it sounds impossible. I want you to know that um, as soon as uh, I started to record this and, and as I finish this, I'm going to, I'm going to be praying for you. Uh, if you want to reach out to someone from our team, if you want to reach out to me personally with hate mail or, or with sincere questions, uh, we're going to have all that info at the description for this. Uh, if you want to uh, to ask questions, if you want to be a part of a church, maybe maybe you live a long way away and, and you're saying, I need to find a church, we'll help you with that. We'll help you with all of it, whatever we can do for you. Uh, we want to serve you as best we can. Uh, but I want to thank you for listening, for watching and engaging with this uh, with an open mind. And uh, I, I pray that if you are struggling with that uh, same-sex attraction, that, that you would be encouraged. You would know that God loves you, that uh, his, his church is for you, uh, and, and you are, are not ostracized, at least from this church. I can't speak for every church. Um, and, and I pray that, you know, you, you've seen, hey, the church isn't the boogeyman. Uh, they're not homophobic. They're not, uh, they're not bigoted, at least not all of them are. And so I, I pray that, that has, this has been an encouraging conversation for you. And then if you are not someone who's dealing with this personally, that I hope that this has helped you to have conversations like the one that we're having here 
with the people that are closest to you. I think as, as much as possible, we wanna to try to win friends and not arguments. We wanna win the person, not the argument. So uh, once again, thank you so much for watching or listening and we'll talk to you real soon.